Joan. It was so uh, lovely having dinner locally with you tonight. It was really nice. Um, I also wanted to say thank you to my book club friends who are here tonight. I moved to the area four years ago, and they um, embraced me with open arms and open minds, and um, it reminds me again and again how important female friendships are and friendships are um, at every stage of life, um, and there's something particularly lovely about those friendships around books and reading and ideas. Um, so... Uh, I am an applied animal behaviorist, a science writer, and for the last 10 years I have been working with um, Barbara Natterson Horowitz, who's the woman on the left, a cardiologist, on looking to the natural world for solutions for human problems. We, um, we met in Los Angeles and when a friend of ours introduced us, we have a mutual friend who said the two of you need to meet. She loves matching people with but just the right book, and she um, told us to uh, introduce ourselves to one another, and we did, and it turned out Barbara was volunteering her time when she wasn't at the human hospital at the Los Angeles Zoo. She told me one day about um, doing a heart imaging uh, procedure on a chimpanzee, and I said, wait a minute, what? <laughs> um, and she said, yes, I was, I was, I was uh, doing this image on a on a chimpanzee. And I said, "Wait, was the did the heart look exactly the same as a human heart? Was it? Like, what were the differences?" And she said, "Well, you know, they were actually identical." And this commonality, deep underneath the fur and the feathers and the skin, but across, across species, became our passion and our academic obsession at that moment. And we wrote our first book, Zubiquity, which looks across species at cancer, heart disease, uh, obesity, infection, and then psychiatric conditions that we think of as being more uniquely human, looking for these commonalities across species. And um, our goal is to find ways of helping human patients, but our work also helps patients of all species. Um, so we developed this research lens where we can do deep literature searches into um, the, the process of understanding animal behavior and animal science and biomedicine. And um, we decided to apply it to um, the idea of adolescence. And part of this was because we um, heard that adolescence is one of the most dangerous times of a, um, of a, of a human being's life. Um, in certain ways, you're more likely to be in a traffic accident, you're more likely to be um, killed accidentally, it, during adolescence, um, but we were also, uh, both of us, both Barbara and I, were raising adolescent animals of our own in our own homes at this time of life. I had a 13-year-old um, when we started, she's 19 now, and um, Barbara had um, has two kids who are just a bit older, um, and so we were um, encountering issues like this, like right. why yes. do kids do that? Um, do we have to do this, and what does it mean for our adolescents and our people? Um, this uh, prom, it's adorable, but what happens when it is more like this? Um, and then also, what about um, what about our our adolescents learning how to live on their own, learning how to do their own laundry, or um, live back in their home? I was looking for photos of boomerang kids, and these came up, and I was kind of um, interested in these very negative portrayals of, um, of adults with their grown children back in the home. Um, so we decided to apply this species-spanning lens that we've developed to this, um, to this idea. And uh, we come from an evolutionary background. We teach uh, undergrads at UCLA. And uh, again, we also had these adolescents at home um, at UCLA and at, at Harvard is where we teach. Um, but the idea is that we are not uh, unique, uniquely um, human in many of our behaviors. Of course, every species is unique. Every species has unique behaviors. They have unique challenges. But because we are all living creatures on planet Earth, we do share certain reactions to certain situations. So um, we want to move beyond human exceptionalism. This, um, the, the protocol that, that we figured out to ask these important questions um, I won't go into the details, but basically it takes a powerful research tool from biomedical investigation, which is called a systematic review, where physicians will look at every piece of um, 
of published literature on a certain topic and put it all together, throw out the ones that are irrelevant, um, uh, interpolate the ones that are, and then uh, come up with a uh, suggestion. Uh, and then we married that with a powerful tool from evolutionary biology, which is called um, phylogeny. And that is a high-tech way of mapping genetic relatedness across species. So what you see here is a phylogeny um, that goes across taxa. So we're able to look scientifically across um, you know, uh, crustaceans, fish, amphibians, reptiles, mammals, and birds to find these commonalities in um, both bodies and behavior. Um, we also did field work around the world. We, uh, we were able to use the Museum of Comparative Zoology at Harvard to look at their specimens there, and we uh, visited sanctuaries and places where wild animals live all around the world. There's, we went to the Duke Lemur Center. Um, in the, the lower left corner, we are on the path of a famous mountain lion in Griffith Park in Los Angeles named P-22. Uh, and then in the lower right, we're at Prince Albert National Park in Canada uh, looking for adolescent uh, bison um, and hoping that the adolescent bear scat that we found wasn't <laughs> hiding in the bushes. What's um, your definition of adolescent? I'm sorry? What's your definition of adolescent? Okay, so, so this, was, um, this was what came out of as we started saying, is it, can we even say that there is adolescence beyond humans? We, uh, we sometimes heard that adolescence is uniquely human, that it's a product of society or our modern times or just our own kind of culture. Um, and what we realized is that if when you think about it, no animal is born mature. So if you think about a fruit fly, a blue whale, a flamingo, there is a process in between the period of time when they are um, <coughs> a juvenile and a mature adult. And what is that? So our definition is um, from the onset of puberty, to the emergence of a mature animal, and it's based on comp competences. And I'll get to those in a second, but it's based on these four core life skills that we identified from the research that we did, that, um, that an animal in the wild, if they don't attain those, they actually are probably not going to make it. In one way that we are uniquely human is that if you don't attain these four competencies, you will still survive. I mean, many of us probably know people who are maybe chronologically adults, but not behaviorally adults. Um, so, um, so we were looking for these behaviors that were unique to that period of time, post-puberty, pre-mature adulthood, and they, um, they fell into sort of four main categories. One was we tended to see that juvenile, that these um, post-juvenile animals were more interested in novelty and new things, and they took more risks. Another is that they tend to prefer their peers to their parents, and they tend to to aggregate in groups. And you see, again, you see it across species, crustaceans through, um, through mammals and birds. Um, another one is that they tend to experiment with uh, courtship behaviors. And in humans, we might call that sexual experimentation, but they're not practicing the actual mating, the copulation part of it. They're practicing what comes before that. And as we discover, that becomes very significant in what that means for our own um, human children. Um, and then finally, they tend to, at a certain age, disperse from their natal territory, which means they tend to leave home. And um, those, again, translated to these four core competencies, which I'll get to in a second. Um, so wildhood is the, um, it's the term that we came up with for that time of life because adolescence isn't quite accurate enough. I mean, if you ask the American Academy of Pediatrics when adolescence begins, you'll get a different, um, and, and when it ends, you'll get a different answer than um, if you were to ask the legal system or the military or uh, a neurobiologist would say it, it you know, begins at age six and goes to age 35. So there's, there's this huge range, and um, we wanted to find a term and this definition that would not be tied to a certain age of life, a, a certain, um, cultural milestone, and so we came up with wildhood. Between childhood and adulthood comes wildhood. So you'll see in this, I hope you can all see, um, these are king penguins uh, in on South Georgia Island off Antarctica. And the black and white ones are the familiar adults that we're used to seeing. The um, fluffy, the big fluffy brown ones, those are chicks. Mm -hmm. And then there's one over there on the bottom uh, left that's half black and white and half kind of brownish, and then the, there's a few others. So. Wildhood is this period of transition. Um, uh, king penguins can't even swim until they've shed their downy, uh, 
their downy juvenile feathers and have grown in these adult feathers that are waterproof. But once they do, they immediately dive into the ocean and they're suddenly adults and they have to, they have to know how to face predators and find their own food. Um, so it's a transition period for them. They're attracted to new places and things. So this is an adolescent hyena and um, she is investigating. I don't know why that person has their window rolled down, but, uh, but she's investigating. Um, and you see this again in, in, in rats and uh, butterflies, that this age group tends to be um, more interested in, in the new. Um, they need to practice certain behaviors. This is a, an adolescent wolf who is just learning how to howl for the first time. So their voices are changing. Um, It has a quavering quality to it, but you can see he's <laughs> So he's um, on his way to becoming an adult. Um, so this I just can't watch enough. It just makes me <laughs> laugh so much. Um, these, the, the four behaviors that we saw, the um, kind of four general groups, and again, it's not that, they, that you don't take risks as an adult or as a youngster, but they, it, you just see it more often in this in-between stage. Um, so we translated um, newness and inexperience, uh, wanting to be with peers, experimenting with courtship behaviors, and uh, dispersing from the nest into uh, four core competencies, safety, status, sex, and self-reliance. And uh, again, we think that these are universal, shared across species, and uh, have a lot of um, relevance for how we raise human teens as parents how we maybe think of being a, a teenager, an adolescent, as an adolescent, and then also as a society, how we treat this very special group of people in this behaviorally very different time of life. Um, so, Is this if, a question? Yeah. yeah. Oh, sorry. Oh, just then I want you to bring in gender here, if there are gender differences, just to be aware of them as we're going along. So I it's, it's such an about. interesting question, right? So there are, I mean, when we look at, um, at other animals, non-human animals, we do think a lot about gender. I mean, it's, it's, you think about that with your dog. Is your dog a boy or a girl? Um, there's, there is more gender fluidity and more spectrum um, sexual behavior in animals than we might at first think. Um, so that's that's one thing. We very specifically didn't want to do boys versus girls in this, in part because um, I think we're used to thinking of risk risk taking boys and you know promiscuous girls or risk taking boys and um, socially obsessed girls. But our point is that these four core competencies need to be learned by every creature, no matter how they identify and. Um, and also, our, um, no matter how they identify, either as a human for gender or species. So, um, so I, I, I'll try. I'll do my best. Um, but I, we tried to make it more general than that. Um, and also, when you think about risk taking, risk taking can be doing what this what this boy was doing, jumping over things. But it can also be getting on stage and doing improv in front of your peers. Like that can be a very scary thing to do and that could be as much of a risk and it can kind of fulfill and satisfy that risk taking tendency in an adolescent as much as driving over the speed limit would for someone else. Mm -hmm. So it's, um, it's not only a sort of age wide um, trait, but it's also very individualized. Um, so if you had, I mean, I'm sure you've all heard about the teenage brain. Like if you had asked me five years ago, why do adolescents take risks? It would be the teenage brain. It's, uh, they have undeveloped prefrontal cortex. It's in this in-between phase. They don't have um, proper or mature or good executive function. They can't make decisions. Um, in fact, we've had our students sometimes say, um, oh, I couldn't turn in my, my assignment because my prefrontal cortex like, I couldn't quite get my act together. Um, and, you know, that, that, is, they, that is true. Adolescent brains look very different than um, juvenile brains and adult brains. Um, but there's something else that um, is really interesting to keep in mind, and that's that um, what looks like risky behavior might actually just be the state of being inexperienced in the world. And we found many, many studies that describe adolescent animals as being easy prey. In fact, we found uh, one species of 
uh, orcas, killer whales, that specialize in hunting adolescent humpbacks because the calves are under the protection of their mothers and the older uh, male elephants and the um, mature adults know how to stay away from a uh, from a killer whale, but they, um, the adolescents are kind of out in the world, they're, they're new, they, they're inexperienced, they don't know how the, um, the orcas hunt, and they are t a actively targeted, and we found that in many other species too, um, some owls and some rodents in South America, um, <coughs> sardines and a certain kind of penguin that, again, specialize in adolescents of those species. So if this one, you can see here on the, um, on the left, that's a mature impala, and there's a crocodile in the water, and she sees it, and she runs away. Mm -hmm. This next one, you can see that that is a, an adolescent impala who has wandered a little bit too far. Um, it's a small trigger warning, but it's not going to show anything. But there's a, there's a crocodile in that water as well. She's, wandered, she's not as experienced. So adolescents are easy prey. Um, and we uncovered this fascinating behavior that animals do, which is called predator inspection. And... These are a group of meerkat that are uh, predator inspecting a Cape Cobra. And they're moving as a group. They're, these are adolescents. They move as a group toward the Cape Cobra. And, and they, um, th this behavior helps them smell and learn and um, see what that cobra is going to look like, what, what the temperature is like when it's likely to strike, what the behavior is like, what, the, what it smells like. Um, and it's also seen in... Um, let's see, that one's, this one's a little bigger. Um, it's seen in um, Thompson's gazelles and cheetahs, where Thompson's gazelles will act, actually move toward their predator rather than fleeing. So they're doing this counterintuitive um, behavior um, that, you know, again, if that was a human, we might call that risk-taking. We might call that risky behavior um, as it's moving toward its predator. Um, this video went viral a little while ago. I don't know if any of you have seen this, but it's, um, it's the back, a backyard in Berkeley, California. And uh, in the middle is a dead cat. And these are adolescent wild turkeys, and they are predator inspecting that dead cat. So um, they sometimes get it a little wrong. They, they know that there's something interesting that they can learn from here, but they're, they're, um, they're but moving that's not, in. That's not like a domestic cat. Um, I think it is a domestic cat. It, is. it looks so big. Um, uh, it does look big, yeah. yeah. Um, but again, these are adolescents, so they maybe they're a little bit right. smaller, or the the thing. I could, I just think it's funny if you imagine um, waking up, like looking out your kitchen window and <laughs> seeing that one morning. Um, so, so this this was fascinating to me was seeing this predator inspection behavior across species. What our takeaway from that is is that there is a certain amount of um, risk-taking that adolescents, it's kind of imposed on them just because of their inexperience, but also they are hardwired to take risks because if they don't, they will not learn about their world. And as a parent, that's <coughs> the, the, that is the core challenge slash tragedy of parenting is knowing when to step in and when to step back and when the lessons need to be learned on their own and when, um, when you need to really guide them. Um, so again, I'm just I'm making this quick tonight. So um, moving on to status. So an, another thing that we noticed was that um, that peers tend to be very important to these adolescent animals, and um, we uh, I mean if you've ever seen a um, eighth grader composing an Instagram post and it's like a matter of life and death, um, it has that feeling probably because in nature, it is a matter of, of life and death where you end up in the social hierarchy. And as adolescents, they are um, developing a system in their brain called the social brain network. And every vertebrate has a social brain network, which is different parts of the brain working together to, at every moment, know where you are in a social hierarchy. Because if you gain higher status in a hierarchy, you have better access to more food, more um, uh, more a variety of mates, and you're safer. You're safer from predators if you're higher status. Higher status animals even get more sleep. They have better immune systems. There's all these. There's all this, um, like real benefit. You might call it privilege that goes along with being um, at the top of a status hierarchy. And so we've evolved these neural systems so that we know where we are at any given moment, and um, we're rewarded for moving up and sort of. Um, 
neurally, neurobiologically punished for falling down in the hierarchy. And that was, um, that's something that Barbara and I introduce and um, argue in our book, is that that is actually a clue to our human moods, is the idea of moving um, up makes you feel good, falling down makes you feel bad, and that's at this ancient elaborated signal of, um, of your status within a group. Um, so uh, the other thing that's really interesting is that uh, we found something called the oddity effect, which is um, that animals that are in a similar, you know, a flock, a herd, or a school, they tend to look and act like one another. And one that's a little bit odd, either colored differently or has a fin that sticks out in a different way or behaves like swims in the opposite direction, is immediately noticeable by a predator. And so they, they endanger themselves and they, they tend to be um, picked off. But not only that, they endanger the other animals around them. And we found many studies in fish and um, some in crustaceans that show that there's a sort of social shunning that happens by animals in a group around the odd-looking animal. Um, and we think that that is um, a basis of some possibly some form of appearance-based bullying, especially in younger adolescents when, when remaining hidden within a group is really important um, from a safety perspective. Um, Another thing is that, so these, these relationships that our brains are tracking at every moment of every day, every time a social animal meets another social animal, there's, um, there's a sort of sizing up that happens. And again, we don't like to think of the, about this that much as, um, you know, in a democratic society where we feel like we're all equal or, you know, uh, the word status has a lot of charge around it. Um, but this is uh, sort of ancient in our biology for, um, like, who's up and who's down when two animals actually have a have a confrontation. Um, what you see on the left is um, is, an ant, is a fish that has won several times. It's, it's been put in a tank with another fish and they fight and then that one has won. And then what you see on the left is a fish that has um, repeated losses. It's not moving. Um, it doesn't move very much anyway, so you can imagine it moving just a little bit. Um, and, you know, we can't ask these two fish what they feel, right? Um, <laughs> because uh, we don't know what an animal's internal state is, but we can look at their behavior and we can study what, um, what that looks like. And animals that have uh, repeated social losses tend to disengage. They tend to have fewer body movements. Um, they tend to not try to engage again after repeated losses. And it's something that behavior is called the loser effect. And animals that win tend to win the next time and win the next time, and that's called the winner effect. And um, again, this is um, something that we think has incredible relevance for, um, for I mean, any li living creature, um, but also anybody who works with or is parenting or coaching um, adolescents who are figuring out wh where, where, where these um, social brain systems are placing them in the world. And also adolescents tend to be sort of lower status anyway because they're younger and more experienced and um, they're kind of the bottom of the heap. Um, and that it is uh, one reason why it is so very important for adolescents to be in a lot of different groups so that they aren't sorted to the bottom of every single one. Um, that um, you know, you, it's not necessarily, you don't necessarily want to claw your way to the top of every single uh, hierarchy that you're in, um, because there's actually a lot of uh, useful learning that can happen by understanding the, the gradient, but um, you certainly it's di very dangerous to be sorted to the bottom in every single group you're in, from family to school to, um, you know, anything else you're doing. Um, next is, um, is sexuality. So we... Um, before I started working on this project, I think I just assumed that animals were born, they somehow developed, and then they just started mating. That was that was the, my conception. Um, I didn't even really think about puberty as a universal phase of life, but it actually is. And there's a little section in the introduction called Jurassic Puberty, where we look at puberty <laughs> way back in time, and um, and that it's. I mean, to think of um, you know whatever fruit fly puberty is kind of interesting to me. Um, uh, so, so um, what we've also learned is that not only do they not just start mating the moment that they are physically capable of reproducing, uh, animals also have what I will call in air quotes a waiting period. Many, I mean, sometimes they do just start mating right away, but many times they will uh, not be able to mate or find a mate until they have mastered the social part of um, 
of courtship, which is um, found in a mind-boggling array of species. It's that um, it's that behavior you've seen a thousand times in nature videos, where you know one bird will go like this, and then the other bird goes like this back, and then they have the sort of courtship display to make them. Um, uh, decide whether they're going to take the next step. Um, and what we found was that while these young animals are learning the moves, they, um, they are not, they're not copulating, so they're not actually having sex. So we, we think that this is sort of a basis of a natural waiting period of having being physically ready for sex, but not emotionally, behaviorally, socially ready for it. Um, and uh, we also think that this has a lot to tell us in this time that we're in of um, sexual consent and coercion. And we go into whether there's co coercion in uh, non-human animals and what sexual consent means. And um, we think that there's a, like a blueprint for how we can um, figure that out in um, humans. Uh, this, is, um, this is an example of how animals have to practice courtship. So, Bald eagles do this incredible courtship display where they fly toward each other really, really fast. They stretch out their talons, they lock them, and then they start cartwheeling down to earth and then go into what's called a death spiral with their heads, their heads down. And then they let go and they fly back up and they fly together and they do it again. They have to do this over and over. These are the mature birds who know what they're doing. So imagine you're an adolescent and you're sort of coming of age and you have to do this thing for the first time. There's a lot going on and they don't always get it. So this first First video will show you um, that these bald eagles, you can see them um, uh, up and down the Hudson. And uh, Walt Whitman actually wrote about this, um, this death spiral. So here's the mature bald eagles. They're flying toward one another, talon extension, talon grass. They're cartwheeling. And now they're doing this death spiral. And then they will let go and they'd fly up and do it again. Now these are two adolescent eagles. Um, they're, you can see they're sort of flying near each other, talon extension, and they're going to try to do the talon grab, and they don't quite get it. <laughs> so the, these ones need a little bit more practice, but you can see they're trying, they're, they're getting there. Maybe this is like uh, junior prom or something. <laughs> um, and then um, this one, this is fascinating. These are layers and albatrosses. And they uh, take up to four years to learn how to do their courtship display before they're able to do it and then find a mate. Um, and they have, it's, it's a beautiful uh, behavior that they do. They do this beak fencing. They do a, a very characteristic bobbing kind of gait. They do a, a neck extension and a stretch and hold. Um, these are two matures that you know, know what they're doing. And then here are the adolescents, and they are, these are three adolescents that are learning how to do it. They're doing the gate, the, the bobbing gate. Um, they're practicing the beak fencing a little bit. One of them's doing the, the wing stretch. And then another way that these young animals learn how to do these very, very complicated and nuanced behaviors is by watching the adults in their midst. And so the two that are sort of sitting in the ground are watching the adults as they do the beak fencing. Um, and that is something also that's interesting to think about as we're raising our own adolescence is um, it does take practice to learn how to um, I just court one another is basically sort of what it comes down to. And, um, and then also that, uh, that, it's, that they are learning by watching adults in their midst what, um, what healthy sexuality is. Um, and again, cultures are going to define that in different ways. Um, but it is, um, uh, it, it's an important part of being an adolescent is having the flexibility to practice, to try, maybe f gently fail in some of these behaviors before actually um, finding yourself in the thick of a sexual relationship. Um, and then finally, self-reliance, this time when animals move into the world on their own, um, it, uh, probably the most important thing that I learned is just how very, very ex inexperienced animals are when they first leave home. Um, this is a koala who's gotten lost in a, um, an electronic store. Often if you, if you read a story about a wild animal that's like shown up in a yoga studio or a schoolyard or something, read the next line and it will be the adolescent, you know, whatever, gazelle, um, 
and here's a, um, a deer that's gotten lost in a liquor store. Um, and then this is an adolescent humpback whale that got lost in a, um, a marina in Ventura Harbor in California. And it spent 48 hours trying to get out of this thing that had a lot of people filming it and trying to get her out of there. And she eventually did, uh, it was a you know, happy ending, she was able to get out. Um, but again, that's just this inexperience in the world. And something that was fascinating to me as a parent was uh, learning how much um, training animal parents give to their offspring before they go. There are wolves that teach their offspring how not only how to eat, how to hunt, how to hunt in a pack, how to um, take down small rodents if you can't get a deer, um, but also even how to take apart the meat and avoid the, the rumen, which is this part that um, is filled with dangerous bacteria that you don't want to eat. So there's a lot of cultural transmission that happens with that. I learned about um, possums in uh, Australia that their parents, um, the mothers will take their young out on what's called practice dispersals. And so they'll, they'll have them find a nest where they uh, will spend a day and a night foraging and sleeping on their own, and then they'll return to mom the next day, and they kind of regroup before they go out. Um, and then finally on, on this idea, the, um, we, we wanted to look at the idea of, of privilege in animal societies and what that means, and um, sort of the bottom line was that um, the world that you disperse into uh, really affects what your experience of growing up and becoming an older adolescence is. So if you go, if you're dispersing into a, a world that has a lot of predators and not very much food, it's going to be much, much harder than if you disperse into a world that has, um, is like abundant with food and, um, and you're in very little danger. And that, that shapes the destinies of the animals that are f um, forced to move into those worlds. And it also, um, it, it kind of, uh, creates some interesting parental behaviors, including something called extended parental care, where parents will continue to uh, feed their offspring, even though those offspring are um, chronologically mature and able to take care of themselves. So for me, it gave me a little bit more um, empathy and compassion for the, for the, the uh, adolescents who move out and then move back home for a little while, and even though the stock photos would have you think differently. Um, Finally, just a little bit, tiny, tiny bit about the book. Um, in addition to these two tools of evolutionary biology and biomedical investigation, um, my background is in um, journalism and um, science writing. And so I structured this book to be um, about four different animals to, to kind of personify these four different um, competencies. And so there's uh, Ursula, who's a king penguin, and there's um, Shrink, who's a spotted hyena in the, the Angora Gora Crater in Tanzania. There's Salt, who's a humpback whale who uh, goes back and forth between the Gulf of Maine and the Dominican Republic. And um, there's Slavic, who was a, a European wolf who left his home in Slovenia uh, as he was uh, dispersing as an adolescent. And he went through the Italian Alps and almost starved to death and almost drowned and almost died of loneliness until he got outside of Verona and um, was able to find a new home and a new life for himself. Um, these are all real animals that were tracked by scientists over uh, weeks and years in some cases with ge geotracking and um, the scientists were the ones who named them. I just want to make that, make that clear that these are not made up animals that we use to illustrate. These are actual stories of, of the actual animals. So with that, I know that was a whirlwind trip through the book, um, but uh, I would love to hear your questions if you have any. <laughs> yes. I have a question. So I was just reading the, um, I guess, the status part of your book, and yep. first of all, that I never knew where the pecking order, where that phrase came from, okay. and that was fascinating, so I don't know if you want to talk about <laughs> that, but I'm curious how the notion that animals have like a hierarchy and there's these are the high ones and this is the second level like how do they know that is it just sort of intuitive like well that one's bigger and stronger and is is everyone on board does everyone agree so and even the chickens i was like right how do they know which is the number one like right how, how do they communicate that so the the pecking order that she's referring to um was an actual um it was a norwegian scientist who at age 10 just became obsessed with chickens and he his mom was able to provide him with flocks every summer and so he would watch his chickens and he would made detailed notebooks about you know 
who was high and who was low and who was eating and who wasn't and what the weather was. And um, eventually he coined the term the pecking order because he realized that they sorted themselves into these uh, linear hierarchies where chicken A could peck chicken B and everyone below her and chicken B could peck everyone below her but not chicken A and it was went down that way. So the pecking order is literal pecking. Um, but what uh, people who've worked on that concept since then have realized is that there's something called transitive rank inference which is that they don't need to get give or receive an actual peck in order for animals to know where they fall. So it, you can, by just watching two other animals in your group interact and knowing how you re relate to one of them, that um, you can infer from that relationship what your relationship is. And so, um, so I mean, there's a lot going on with, with this idea. So, um, we are social animals. We do have these social hierarchies. We do have um, social brain networks that have evolved over... A, at least 600 million years for the, um, for the safety benefits of living in a group and living peacefully in a group. Um, and again, we're all the descendants of these, of you know, our animal ancestors that this served them very well. We're all sort of socially intelligent in a way because of that. Um, but as, as human beings, it can be kind of, um, it, I don't know, off-putting that, that we're in these social hierarchies. But what we found was that there are ways that they can change. And one way that, um, Shrink, who's, oh, he's not up there anymore, but Shrink the hyena, um, he was born to a, um, a low-ranking mother, and he was a male, and males are, the, are low, rank lower than females in hyena society. So, and he was a twin of a, so he was like a low-ranking male of a, 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 the second twin and of a low-ranking mother. So he was, he was not really set up for a good life, but he had really good social skills, and um, having friends and allies in hyena society is very important too. So he was able to work his way up the system that way, and he also had um, what uh, what the scientists who studied him actually called a certain kind of um, perseverance or grit uh, and charisma that he um, was able. Well, I don't want to spoil the chapter, but um, <laughs> he was able to. Um, find a way to get himself in um, some better nutrition and kind of associate with um, a different part of the hyena clan, and he was able to better his life. And the sci th this was the scientist's word. He said, shrink went on to live a happy life. So um, again, take that as you will um, in a non-anthropomorphic way. It was just like what, whatever that means for hyena. Um, and, and again, it's in, in some ways it's sort of off-putting that we have these um, that status is so important in our evolutionary history, but it's also, um, I sort of believe that if we don't understand what's actually going on when we meet as in groups, that it's really hard to create fairer societies and really hard to um, you know, advocate for ourselves and our kids while making sure that others aren't on the losing end of that. So is it, would you say it's true, sorry, that your status can change. It's yeah. not just sort of set yes. in yeah. stone. Yes, yes, okay. yes. And yeah, and there are, there are other rules for, for changing it. I mean, and some are more, are more um, palatable than others. Like there's something called association with high status animals, which, um, which means that the sort of like the, just standing next to a favored animal in the group, um, taking a selfie with the favorite animal in the group and putting pictures of with you and a politician, you know, like the, those kinds of things do confer some of that higher status on you. That's not necessarily good or bad. That's that's one way of um, uh, that could be news that a that a high schooler could use, um, and it also could explain you know why why it feels so important to go to the in group party and take a selfie at that in group party. So some of that. <laughs> yeah. So I was just wondering if you would equate that to emotional learning in an animal, where um, that kind of um, intuition or that young animal. Um, knows to stand next to a, uh, a high-powered uh, yeah, well, colleague. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. What's interesting is I guess some of that would probably be instinctive, and somebody, and a, an animal like Shrink maybe had some of that just like firing him, but it's also a learned behavior, and we found in hyenas there's, um, there's a behavior called maternal intervention. Um, it's a, called maternal intervention, but honestly it's probably... Um, seen across species as parental intervention, where the mothers will intervene on behalf of their offspring and make sure that their offspring win fights. Um, I and teach in high school, I can <laughs> guarantee you that's true. <laughs> yes, well, I mean, I, I, when, I, when I discovered that, again, I was parenting an adolescent and just sort of thinking about, um, about all the behind the scenes 
stuff that's at play while um, that weights things in favor of, of one child versus another. Um, another. Another very interesting part about learning is peer learning and, the, um, and that peer, we call, tend to call it peer pressure, right? But it's not always a bad thing that there are certain behaviors like that predator inspection that we saw um, that if you live to tell the tale, um, you learn it much better and you learn it um, better if you're with your peers doing that risky thing. Um, and there's also safety in numbers, keeps you safer and um, so, yes. Um, so I have an adolescent who's probably jumping just like that. <laughs> right now. He's, right now. He's a freshman in college and he's pledging a fraternity. And I'm wondering if you've seen in the animal kingdom any kind of pledging where you might have to, where maybe older adolescents put the younger ones through some sort of tests or adults put them through some sort of tests that they have to pass? There's a very interesting word that I learned called a phobia, and it is called, it's the, um, it's the sort of hatred or exploitation of adolescence. And so, um, yes, there are, you do see when there's these groups of, um, of animal, even within, even if they're all adolescent, um, when there's an age hierarchy, that the older ones will exploit the younger ones. Okay, tell them it's, it's yeah. I mean, I, deep in the animal kingdom, not just yes. your. I, yeah, I'm so, and, I'm yeah. surprised to th to realize that I haven't really applied it so directly to to hazing or you know whatever like whatever the milder version yeah. of that is yeah. affiliating maybe yeah. um, in a fraternity yeah. um, or other group. But that's really interesting. But yes, there is there's a definite age hierarchy that that age is one of the biggest markers of um, animal hierarchies. Yeah. How did you choose those four animals? Um, I was looking for animals that we had enough data on so that I could tell a full story, tell their coming of age story in a satisfactory way. So that was the main thing. And then I also wanted some geographical diversity. So that was, that was the main reason. But then also trying to find, um, you know, in a way we are all Ursula and we are all um, shrink and we are all salt because we've all had to go through these four very important life stages. Um, and so I wanted, I also wanted animals that had a little something that we could all relate to. Yes. Does the status seeking go away in any of these species on maturation or is it just sort of a positive life force that you continue to uh, pursue throughout life? That is a really good question. Um, I, it never goes away entirely, but it's during adolescence where it's most intense because not only are they kind of inexperienced and out on their own and figuring it out and their brain systems are developing, um, but it's also when they're practicing it um, and they don't really know what they're doing yet. So that's, so it, you do see it, um, a certain kind of social danger and social um, interest in, in that social piece in that adolescence. Stage. The other question, these kids are learning sort of uh, often on their own with computers picking up ideas which are not necessarily close to nature or any natural setting one could even imagine actually happening. Mm -hmm. So they're exposed to violent situations and those sorts of things. I don't know, your study obviously couldn't touch on that, but do you feel like that's sort of now changing the way people develop, youth develops when they're exposed to those yes. sorts of unnatural? I do. I do think so, especially um, there's something about, um, I mean, social media is, can be great in a lot of ways. And in one way it can be great is it can allow you to be in a different group and experiment with different um, social status. Um, but I do think that there's a... Um, there's an in real life component that is really necessary. And another interesting fact that I came across during this research was um, that animals that are exposed to social comparison have more anxiety than they don't. And social comparison is a, it's a crucial part of every animal's life. Like it's going to happen, but it, in uh, the non-human world it tends to be seasonal or periodic. Um, and here we have it, it's now constant. And not only is it constant, it's um, permanent. There's a permanent record of it. And it follows you around like you don't ever get any break from it. It's in your bedroom. It's in, on your car ride home. Um, so one suggestion we make is uh, 
to talk about or think about or try to create status sanctuaries where you get a break from that social from that social comparison, that biology of comparison, um, whether it's how many likes you have or you know who's doing who's on a better vacation than you. Um, I think that that can be a big relief. But isn't it a new reality for them? Um, the social this, media this aspect? kind of life yeah. would be a new reality. Well, I, that they may have to, you know, go through that we haven't had. The oh, I see what you mean. Like they need to learn how to do it yeah. before. Um, they need. They need to know how to. They survive. need to know how to survive, <laughs> to survive. that kind yeah. of environment. Um, well, what's what's really interesting <laughs> is that they actually, when you think about it, they have to go through all four of life skills online um, in it a way that be. in it a way they're not like they have to learn how to be safe from predators that want to eat them and exploiters that want to take advantage of them. They have to learn how to navigate social hierarchies online and understand what that means um, without the benefit of having an in real life like social brain network uh, experience. They have to um, understand what it means to communicate um, sexual desire and interpret the desire of others and also express their own sexuality and what that looks like online. And they have to um, we, we call it self-reliance, so they have to learn how to li live a full life like online as well. Uh, and w again, what, whatever that means, if that means um, remaining, creating a true self, remaining true to yourself. So yes, it is a new reality, and, um, and I, I think that makes it uh, triply challenging for um, any parent who's helping someone go through it, any teacher who's helping someone go through it, and adolescents themselves. I, I was wondering, because I work with teenagers, um, uh, one of the things teenagers definitely have to deal with is mind-altering chemicals, mm -hmm. where the people, the animals in the natural world don't have that. Did you figure, did you figure that into any of your studies and your... So, um, our first book, Zubiquity, we have a chapter called Zuphoria, which is all about uh, substance seeking in non-human animals and um, and it exists and I mean it's everything from cedar wax wings that find fermented berries and then fly while intoxicated and crash into buildings um, <laughs> and, um, and uh, you know there's there's rats that will uh, leap over huge boundaries to get to cannabis plants and there's um, dogs that will lick um, hallucinogenic toads to get high and they do it over and over and over and like claw at the back door to get out to their toad, to these toads. Um, so that does exist. We didn't look at it specifically in this book as um, an adolescent behavior. However, um, it, we, we think it's actually um, more related to the social piece than to the um, risky behavior piece because uh, appearing to be older, appearing to take on older um, attributes can raise an animal's status, as we were just saying in the group, the older you are. Um, so some of that pressure to, um, uh, to use substances might be coming from that desire to look older. Um, and then also the, the, you know, the highs are higher and the lows are lower, so there's just less, um, the, their, their brains are developing at that time, so the, um, it um, sort of has more effect on them. So, so animals do it also. Um, again, I didn't. I didn't come across any specific study that looked specifically at adolescents. Um, oh, no, animals. You said. Oh that. yeah, animals in general. Yes. Um, and and just to just to like put that in perspective, those could have been adolescent animals in all of those studies that we read. But fascinatingly, there's very little um, demarcating of juveniles from sub-adults from adolescents like with this flexible definition um, you can you know read that they did a study on whatever 60 mandrels <laughs> in the wild and the, it doesn't say what age they were did you change your parenting style at all during the <laughs> six years um, and has your daughter read the book um, <laughs> my my daughter <laughs> yeah she has a love-hate relationship with the book, mostly love <laughs> um, her favorite chapter, to my great surprise, was um, sexuality, the one about salt. Um, although she did tell me the other day to stop, stop talking about practicing courtship. <laughs> um, but I think that for me that was um, that was one area where I I had just moved. I had been living in Hastings on Hudson until just recently, and I had just moved there, and um, they they canceled all school dances. 
Um, and my first thought was, oh, that's good, because there's probably all kinds of unsavory things that happen at school dances. And then I was, you know, a few months later in the research for this book thinking about how school, fine, if school dances are a problem, don't have school dances, but we need to find ways for young people to practice the social behaviors around um, consensual meeting. <laughs> I don't know how else to say it, but um, so that that's one thing. And so I, I found myself a little bit more encouraging her to, you know, go out with friends and you know, maybe like go on dates and that kind of thing. Um, and then also practice dispersals were a big a big part of our of our family. And actually using that phrase. I and mean, last summer I took my um, my niece to the airport. Uh, she was going for like three weeks somewhere, and my um, sister couldn't do it. So I took her to the airport, and she was really nervous. And I said, um, it's going to be okay. You're on a practice dispersal. You'll just go, you'll go off, and you'll come back, and it'll be fine. And so she like, dried her tears and um, got on the plane, and all was good. And then I called my sister, and, um, and she's in tears. And I said, it's all okay. It's a practice dispersal. She's going to go away. She's going to come back, and um, she'll, she'll learn a lot. So um, practice dispersal as a phrase was, was good for our family. <laughs> So are animals as protective of their uh, young ones? Um, yes. Especially during adolescence, or do they say, go fend for yourself? It's a mix. And what's really interesting is um, something called flexible parenting, where um, a mother or, you know, the parents, if they're both, if they're co-parenting, um, will give different resources and attention to different animals, in, even in the same litter or clutch, depending on their needs. And um, that is really interesting, that it's not like, you should always be a helicopter parent. You should never be, you should be a snowplow. You shouldn't, like, as human parents, we get so much, in, like, um, ju judgment and information on how we're supposed to, to parent. But it's actually, it's a lot more flexible um, in the wild. And again, the, um, the idea that there is a lot of training that, that goes into these animals before they actually leave home um, was really useful. So when you wrote this book, did you watch a lot of the videos of all these uh, animals, or oh, how did you go well, about writing it? There's this uh, explosion in animal video now that's a, really just a treasure trove for all of us as you know, fellow creatures on Earth, um, and, uh, and also all the new technologies that allow us to see animals in ways that we never have before, drones and whatever. Um, so yes, yeah, so we did a lot of video watching, we did a lot of interviewing of elephant experts and panda experts and like experts in their in the field um, and then we did these um, deep and broad literature searches um, sorry um, so I just want to say my, my daughter I don't normally text when I'm watching a talk but I'm, when you <laughs> said P19 I, I texted oh. my daughter so my daughter actually um, um, track P22 and oh. her cubs P46 oh. and P47. Oh my God! So oh. when I told her, and she says, "Oh, you know, P22 was one of the lines in your stu in her study, but he didn't need tracking while you were there." So it just like, and she's like, "Oh, I'm so sad I didn't come." Oh, you know, oh. Come. So, oh. She, yeah, so. Is she working out in California then? Not right now. Oh. But she's done. She's in wildlife conservation, so she's done various oh. things, and she's currently working at the Wolf Center up in um, South yeah. Salem. So, oh, that's so they cool. are actually putting up a that's bunch right. of cameras because they have cameras and you really do get to see incredibly cool behavior from like the bobcats and, and the coyotes and stuff, you know, the the marking and the, you know, just it's it's really cool what um, anyone wants cameras, you should do it. You it, know, put them out in your yard. It has um, opened yeah. up the field of animal behavior, yeah. like like nothing else. There's a peregrine falcon um, cam on the, um, you know, that new the new this happens bridge. bridge yeah. um, I, I know. <laughs> I <can't remember. laughs> um, and it's no, yeah. It's, no. it's, it's, <laughs> is is your daughter involved in the uh, the wildlife crossing that they're building out there? Well, she's the, aware of it because uh, she's still on all of the the stuff. You know, in so many of the um the, the those mountain lions have been killed recently with the the rodenticide. Yep. You know, so anybody who uses rat poison don't. <laughs> um, it's really problematic. You know, owls and lots of other animals. Yeah, but, it really yeah, works through the um, the whole ecosystem. Yeah. So they've lost quite a few of those mountain lions between the fire and and poison. But yeah, and one one just recently was on camera and was they they would tracked him like being chased by an unmarked mountain lion. And then he ran into, I don't know, across one of those highways because there isn't the overpass. Right. Um, so, yeah, it's really sad. It is. 
but very cool. Yeah. This is a really cool book. I can't wait. I'm going to assign it to my AP Bio kids, I think, because oh. I think they'd really, really like oh, it. Oh, excellent. I'm great. happy to hear that. We're working on curriculum for um, high school and uh, early college courses at the moment. Cool. You have to come yeah. in. Okay, good. Yeah. <laughs> Any other Any questions? questions? Thank you. Oh, yeah. Sorry to ask another one, but it's a, it's a straight. My dog was <laughs> taken away from his mother when he was, I don't know, pretty young, right? And he seems to have all these behaviors that he didn't hang out with other dogs to learn because he really doesn't have that much time with other dogs. Mm -hmm. So animals seem to have imprinted behaviors in their gen genetic makeup. Is there any understanding of that? Is there any linkage um, to genetics or...? I mean, it, there, it all comes from a genetic substrate, right? And another huge um, sort of explosion in animal behavior is the idea of animal personality and that some are bold and some are shy and so, like that there's this variation so there would be some combination of the environment what happens to that animal in combination with the genetics underlying personality and other kinds of behaviors so so but you made me think of something really interesting which is called shelter dog syndrome if you talk to dog behaviorists um, where animals that are dogs that are surrendered um, and then spend their adolescence in a shelter environment that's very loud and very, sometimes they're attacked by other dogs um, and, it's, and they're often not socialized, they're kept in separate cages, um, fare much worse than, than dogs that are brought in as puppies and dogs that are brought in as adults. Um, it's a very, very hard time for them to be an adolescent in this kind of um, shelter environment. And then the other thing that's really um, very, very sad, um, but also notable is that um, the most common age for dogs and cats and parrots and rabbits and many other animals to be surrendered to shelters is adolescence because they've been this cute little puppy or whatever with, that you kind of overlook any it's actually called puppy license like they have a little bit of leeway um, but then they start doing this extremely normal adolescent behavior that's normal for their time of life that they will eventually outgrow but it becomes too much for the um, owners to handle and they surrender them at that age. It's also the time that they're most likely to be banished to the backyard and put on a, you know, tied to a stake or whatever. So um, it's just sad and interesting that that's a, almost a risk factor, mm -hmm. adolescence yes. being a risk factor for being surrendered to a shelter. I don't think... Just put a plug in for, a foster, for fostering. If you like animals, to avoid, to help animals avoid that, there are a lot of agencies around that really need foster homes for that very reason so that you can take in an animal temporarily and, and help, um, uh, you know, get it acclimated to being in a home, and it really helps them find permanent homes. It does. You know, to, yeah. to be able to foster. So. For a dog, what would the period of adolescence correspond to in, in time? It, um, it varies by breed, but it tends to be around six months to around two years. I wonder if domestication sort of help changes the behavior from the wild, you know, uh, because most of the dog uh, pets that we have are probably bred, um, you know, for um, being uh, as pets. Mm -hmm. So maybe they maybe their behavior also is a little different. Yeah, yeah. I wonder. About yeah, um, I. Think the short answer is yes, that there would be differences there. Um, in the beginning of the book, we actually have a, um, an illustration that shows this wildhood phase across a bunch of species from a fruit fly that has a, a like it lives for 80 days and has a very short amount of time that it's an adolescent to a Greenland shark that lives to 500 years doesn't even start puberty until it's 150 years old, which is kind of amazing. And then it spends many, many years in this kind of pubertal stage. Um, but we have a little asterisk for uh, domestic cats and dogs because we, we put their kind of ages in there. But yes, their lives are going to be a bit different. The same way ours are, um, just because of our sort of human ability to control the environment more. Did you say there's this an animal that lives 500 years? Did you say 500? It's amazing it's it's incredible and um, how many of them are around um they've only just been kind of f found and figured out and it's um uh not to bring up climate change but you know the climate crisis is really hard for them because if they don't even start puberty until 150 if the climate changes by the time they're from between when they're born and when they're supposed to enter puberty it can be greenland shark greenland shark 
Yes. And if we buy Greenland, do we go there? Yeah, they're up in that northern area. Yeah. I mean, there's these giant clams that live for hundreds of years, and um, it's really fascinating to look at these long lived creatures. Mm -hmm. How many generations of scientists would have been? Well, exactly right. You'd have to pass down your research. <laughs> yeah.